Uh, if you weren't here last week, we did 2nd and 3rd John, and so we're jumping ahead to Jude. Um, this is where everyone asks, are we going to listen or sing the song? The answer is no. We are going to open with a word of prayer, though, and uh, then we'll talk about this short little book. Heavenly Father, we uh, come to you tonight, and it is... Uh, good to be together, and it's good to be in a book that certainly we don't uh, give as much attention as we should, and we thank you for uh, Jude and his life and what he had to say through you, or that you had to say through him, and we just pray that uh, you would be with us tonight, that your spirit would be with us, and that you would teach us uh, what it is that you would desire for us to to get from this text and to apply to our lives, and I do pray that we would increase in our mercy towards one another and increase in our peace across the board. In Jesus' name, amen. This holiday at T-Mobile. This holiday at T-Mobile tonight is brought to you by T-Mobile.com, your great source for Samsung or for the more optimum Apple iPhone 12X. <laughs> what, what, what are we doing back there? Are you guys watching YouTube? <laughs> watching YouTube videos? <laughs> yeah, we already, we already missed that joke. That joke is like so, <laughs> so two minutes ago. All right, so the book of Jude, uh, verse 1, how... Uh, By a show of hands, how many of you have really ever read the book of Jude? Before this week. (laughs) So Jude is obviously not the shortest book uh, in the New Testament, but it is a very short book. It opens with the formal Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James. There's a lot of debate about who Jude is. His real name is Judas. Uh, and, and so then there's all this discussion about why does he refer to himself as Jude versus Judas and all, and all of that. Um, obviously, there's, you know, if your name was Adolf, you might change your name to Dolph. <laughs> like, you don't want to. Uh, that maybe is the easiest explanation. What's interesting about his intro is uh, that, that he says that he's the brother of James. Well, we know the brother of James is the brother of Jesus, so why does he not say Jude, a brother of Jesus? Uh, he says Jude, a slave of Jesus Christ and brother of James. Part of it is uh, he doesn't want to walk uh, certainly on the coattails of Jesus. He wants to show his deference to Jesus as his uh, Lord and as his Savior, and he uses this language of slave, uh, which Paul does as well, to, to show where he finds himself positionally as it relates to Jesus and his ministry. Interestingly, most people don't believe that Jude uh, was a believer in Jesus as the Messiah when Jesus was living. It wasn't until after his ascension that that Jude uh, really came to faith, which is typical younger brother stuff. Like, your oldest brother is the Messiah, and you're like, (laughs) yeah, right. (laughs) Not a chance. And then he ascends into heaven, you're like, oh, okay, maybe he was. So uh, he starts off with this very eloquent and and moving opening, uh, declaring himself a slave of Jesus um, and also a brother of James. Certainly part of the brother of James thing is to to give himself some credibility, but also to tie him to um, James, who also wrote the book of James. He says, to those who are called, uh, which is interesting, is he saying, those who are called beloved or those who are called, in essence, anyone who is a follower of Jesus, which are the beloved in God, the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ. There's, there is some question around how we add that uh, comma in there. I don't think it's of utmost importance. Um, 
Basically, to those who identify as followers of Jesus Christ, I'm writing you this letter. Who is he writing to? We don't really know specifically, other than that they were a, a group of followers. We don't get, obviously don't get a specific church name or a specific location. Um, we do know that it was around the 50s and 60s when he was writing this. There is a very interesting connection between Jude and 2 Peter. Did Jude come first and Peter uh, took some of what Jude had to say and put in, into his second letter? We're actually going to take that conversation and we're going to uh, put a pin in it. We're going to talk about it next year when, when we go between 1 Peter and and Second Peter. So we'll talk more about that conversation um, when we get into Second Peter. In uh, I think it's about March. So you plan ahead for that one because I know you're all going to want to be here for that. So like I said, uh, about in the fifties uh, and sixties, as far as age-wise of when he would have wrote, written, writ, rat wrote this, written this letter. He says, "May." Mercy, peace, and love be multiplied uh, to you. Again, the, this ancient Near Eastern style of writing with this initial greeting. There's some, some uh, discussion around the grammatical structure of the whole letter, um, which I, I know many of you are like, oh, I was really looking forward to getting into that. Uh, we can get into that later. Uh, but if you look at how the book starts and how the book ends, there's very much this uh, grammatical device called the inclusio, where it starts and ends similarly. Um, but like I said, if you, want, if you really want to dive into that, we can get into that uh, at a different time. Uh, May mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. One thing about Jude is he's a big fan of threes. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, triads or triplets that occur uh, throughout the letter. So uh, if you can mark every single one, you'll win a prize to be determined later. It might be in a bag that's out there with someone's name on it that probably isn't going to pick up their present. Uh, beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith uh, that was once for all delivered to the saints. So he uses the same beloved that we saw in John, uh, really this term of endearment for this group of people that, that he cares for uh, very deeply. It's interesting because he gives us this a bit of a pump fake saying, I was eager to write to you. What I really wanted to write to you was about our common salvation. That was what he was initially going to write about. But what he decided to write about was this concept of contending for the faith. So one thing I want to talk about briefly, because we're going to get into it later, is this concept of common salvation and how we view uh, this concept of salvation in the now and the not yet. It's, um, it's something we're going to talk about, in essence, the possession of salvation in the present, but also in the future, and we're going to come back to that um, towards the end. But why would he be writing to them uh, that they would contend for the faith? Well, clearly, we know that there was some opposition, you know, 50s and 60s. The church certainly was not this big powerhouse. There wasn't a lot of uh, acceptance uh, of those who were followers of Jesus. And so there was all of this jockeying for position, and as we talked about throughout John, you know, these heresies that were coming in and trying to overtake the faith. And Jude really sees a potential problem existing for those who are followers of Jesus Christ at the time. And it is these threats from the outside that have infiltrated to the inside. And so what he is writing to and his whole purpose in writing this letter is to help them contend for the faith. The faith meaning this totality of the church and this unified belief in Jesus Christ and lived uh, faith 
that he is going to get into. What I will say is um, there's many, many weed patches. This is a lot like Clark Lake. There's many big, thick weed patches in Jude that we could get into. And I'm sure there's some really juicy, delicious bass in there. We're going to avoid them. If you, want, if you see a weed patch that you want to circle back to, again, well, we could talk about that um, at a different time. So as we're going here and you're like, oh, we should get into that, we'll kind of tease it and maybe we could talk about it later. So verse 5, now I wanted to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus, who saved a people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels who did not stay within their position of authority, but left their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desire, serve as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. So, big picture here, there's these people that are existing outside the church, trying to infiltrate the church, and trying to take down the church. He wants to give us some big reminders of how God has acted in the past and dealt with opposition from outside the church. And so he starts with uh, this example of the people of Egypt rescuing the people out of the land of Egypt. Well, what's the first thing that you said, um, excuse me, something is off in how he describes what took place uh, with these people? Who said it? Sunday school answer. Jesus. He says Jesus is the one who saved them out of the land of of Egypt, and it causes us to scratch our heads and say, well, isn't that an interesting perspective of Jude to see that Jesus was active in the rescuing of the people out of the land of Egypt before Jesus was the incarnate Messiah on this earth? But he reminds them, if you have forgotten God brings the people out of Egypt, you know, the, the, the crossing of the Red Sea and all that stuff. And then what happens? The wilderness, right? And he saves them out and they get to the promised land and they're like, yeah, we're not interested in going in. At least 10 of the 12. You know the whole story. Kadesh Barnea, that was for you, Tom. God saves these people. They become disobedient. And what does he do? He kills them. (laughs) Jude's like, let's just get our perspective on this God that we're talking about. He is not afraid to punish people who don't do as he requires of them. And then in verse 6, he talks about the angels who did not stay within their own position of authority. All of us Genesis 6 people, one of the most obscure sections of verses in the Bible. You're all familiar, right? About the Nephilim and the angels coming to the earth, and right? It's a story that gets told a lot in Sunday school, except never. Because it's one of those Bible verses where you're like, what? This is in the Bible? Yes. So these angels... We're like, yeah, this heaven thing is pretty cool, but we're going to go do our own thing, disobedient again. And what does God do? He locks them in eternal chains under the gloomy darkness until the day of judgment. Then he goes to the um, all-familiar reference to Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities. Again, a people who go and do what they desire, being disobedient and completely flagrant in their lifestyle. And what does God do? (laughs) They serve as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. 
So it's like, in case you're wondering, guys, if you're going to be disobedient to who God is and what he has called you to, uh, here's your options. Would you like to die in the wilderness, be locked in eternal chains, or die by fire? Let's see what's behind door number three. Probably not. Yet, in like manner, verse 8, these people, who are these people? The people that are trying to infiltrate the church with uh, their perversions and heresies. These people, also relying on their dreams, defile the flesh, reject authority, and blaspheme the glorious ones. Again, uh, for those of you keeping score at home, there's another triad for us. Uh, Those who, relying on their dreams... What do they do? They defile the flesh, they reject authority, and they blaspheme the glorious ones. But when the archangel Michael, contending with the devil, was disputing about the body of Moses, he did not presume to pronounce a blasphemous judgment, but said, the Lord rebuke you. But these people blaspheme all that they do not understand. And they are are destroyed by all that they, like unreasoning, Animals understand instinctively. Woe to them. Woe to them. Again, he paints this picture using these clear biblical references to how God has chosen to deal with people who do what? Defile the flesh, reject authority, and blaspheme the glorious ones. And we get a a bit of a picture into who these people are. He's talking about this reliance on dreams. You know, this sort of a divination theme. theme. And and it's, you ever have somebody uh, who's like, what do you think this dream means? A friend of mine, he's been having all sorts of crazy, vivid dreams, and he was texting a group of us about them the other day, and he's like, Guys, I think it means something. And I said, what did you have, spicy tacos for dinner? That's what I think it means. Unlike Tom's dream where he dreamt that he made a full court shot, which he's going to make on January 4th, that was totally real, that was prophetic. I'm not denying your dreams. Dream your dreams. They were into this sorcery type thing, And that leads into these other uh, things. So we could get in, again, get into the weeds on on the contending for the devil, you know, the devil and the archangel around the body of Moses. Um, Basically, what he's trying to remind them is that God, even Michael, the archangel, isn't the one who's rebuking Uh, these people or these principalities, he's saying the position of that, the rebuker, is God's job. So he says, the Lord rebuke you. This is not my job. This is God's job. These people are off the rails, unreasoning animals, understand instinctively. And he pronounces this woe. And if you... you, uh, are into the Old Testament. Um, this is a common theme. Woe to them is a very common literary theme around uh, warnings and punishments and uh, be, be careful about what's about to come. This is, not, um, this is not a good thing. So if somebody says, woe to you, um, they're probably not talking in biblical terms because people just don't talk like that anymore. Woe to them, and he gives us another uh, triad, for they walked in the way of Cain and abandoned themselves for the sake of gain to Balaam's heir and perished in Korah's rebellion. He goes with this great uh, Old Testament trinity of bad characters. <laughs> Right? So we know Cain. What is the way of Cain? Murder. So I thought someone might say, if Chuck was here, he's going to watch this at home. He'll probably text me after he watches it. The way of Cain is extra dipping sauce. Yeah? 
right? Save the Texas toast, give me some more of that cane sauce. Different kind of cane. Cain was about selfishness and anger and unrepentance. Remember, God has, gives him this opportunity, and ra- rather than repenting and coming to his senses, he doubles down, and God chooses to use him as an example. These people are doing the same thing. They're given an opportunity to repent, and they're doubling down, and they're being selfish. Uh, and then they go on, he goes on to talk about Balaam. What was Balaam's deal? He was greedy. He sabotaged the Israelites. What do we always have to remember about Balaam? His talking donkey. Yes. I'm pretty sure Shrek was modeled after Balaam. Maybe not. But Balaam was greedy. And one commentator says this, they gave themselves completely to the kind of deception that Balaam practiced for the sake of money. If you remember last week, we were talking about how these preachers uh, would go around and they would solicit funds, and that was a key indicator that they were not of Christ. They were trying to solicit money for their own gain. A preacher who's soliciting money for their own gain is an example of, as Jude would say, Balaam. Not somebody you want to be labeled after. Some of my daughter's friends have started calling me the Sandman. That's better than Balaam, okay? (laughs) Somebody, you do not want to be identified as Balaam. If you want to look it up, uh, Numbers 22. Korah's rebellion. Again, if you remember back to our study uh, of... Moses and all these things. Korah didn't like Moses and Aaron, and he tried to subvert the authority of Moses and Aaron and subvert the authority that God had placed in the Israelite nation or group of people, the Israelites. And so what does God do? He just takes care of them, opens up the earth, and bye bye So these people are going to experience destruction at the hand of God. And Jude wants to remind these people of that. He says, these, these, pe- these, or these people, are hidden reefs. They are the bowtie flats of Gull Lake. Which, if you don't have a boat that draws four feet, you don't care. Because you won't get hung up on it. They are the hidden reefs at your love feasts as they feast with you without fear. Shepherds feeding themselves, waterless clouds swept along by winds, fruitless trees in late autumn, twice dead, uprooted, wild waves of the sea casting up the foam of their own shame, wandering stars for whom the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved forever. Jude has some mighty strong words about who these people are, and what it looks like when they're in your group of faith, your church, and how God is going to take care of them. Now, he makes this reference to love feasts. There's some discussion. Are we talking about communion? We're talking about the communion table. You know, Paul talks about communion uh, in Corinthians, and he, what we know about love feasts is it was more than communion. But often communion was a part of these love feasts. What was the thing with Paul and and the communion table or the love feast, right? There was this stratification. So the expensive or the rich people, the important people in that church sat in a certain area and ate certain food, and the poor people sat in a certain area and ate certain food. And much like at my house, whenever you sit down at the table, you just start eating. You have no care or regard for the person who made the meal. Oh, wait. I'm sorry. Forgive me at home. My family's not watching, so they're not even listening. The the behavior that was taking place at these love feasts within the body that was supposed to be this communal gathering, this group of people that loved and cared for each other, was, was being undermined by these other people that had infiltrated the church. And they are a huge warning, and Jude wants this 
this baby church, I mean, we're talking 50s and 60s, the church is not very old at this time, these people are working their ways into the, to the congregation, and it's a dangerous position. He says, they feast with you without fear. They think they're pulling the wool over on God's eyes, and they can do whatever they want. Meanwhile, <laughs> he says, they are waterless clouds, which clearly he's not interested in any clouds except those that bring rain. Fruitless trees in late autumn. They are worthless. They are worthless to you. Certainly, when we hear that fruitless trees, we think about Jesus talking about a good tree bears good fruit. Um, Wild waves of the sea, they are dangerous. Verse 14, it was, about, uh, it was also about these that Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment on all and to convict all the ungodly of all their deeds of ungodliness that they have committed in su- such an ungodly way and all of the harsh things that ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are grumblers, malcontents, following their own sinful desires. They are loud mouth boasters, showing favoritism to gain advantage. I'm not sure if you've gotten it to this point. Jude isn't real keen on these folks hanging out and being a part of the body of Christ at this time. And he references Enoch which is another great weed patch that we could dive into and talk about who is Enoch and why is Jude referencing extra-biblical literature and what does that mean for us today and the canon that we have and the influence of extra-biblical literature on our lives. We're just going to keep moving. If you want to get into that weed patch, we'll get into it uh, at a different time. Enoch was talking about this, prophesying that this would happen. And what Jude is saying is, I've read Enoch, I've heard Enoch's prophecy, and this is happening. And what is the most important thing? That the church is going to rise up and weed these people out of their midst? The church is going to start calling people out by name and saying, you're one of them? Get out of here? No. The Lord comes with ten thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment on all and to convict all the ungodly of their deeds of ungodliness that they have committed in such an ungodly way. (laughs) Again, he loves threes. He uses ungodly three times to drive his point home. We have such a strong desire, we talked about this a little bit last week, of defining that that the essentials are this big category of things and we need to fight to the death around the essentials and and we got to find out who these people are and root these people out and punish these people and call these people to account and we need to not only do it in here we need to do it in the world and we have all of these fights and crusades literally crusades around our specific little things that we think are so important and God surely wants me to help him out in executing his judgment on these people And what Jude is reminding the people is God has this under control. There's a lot of things going on. There's a lot of uh, underhandedness taking place. These people are infiltrating the church. These people are doing all of these bad things. 
it's not the church's job at this point to execute judgment on these people. Jude wants to remind these people that God is in control. God is sovereign. God sees what's happening. And God is going to execute judgment on those that he deems worthy, which is kind of a funny way to say that, worthy of his judgment and execution. And you're like, I, I want to respond, yeah, but he needs to hurry up. I can't wait any longer. And I was, I was telling this uh, story earlier at lunch, and my oldest brother and I, we'd love to go to movies together, and uh, if he was the Messiah, I wouldn't have acknowledged he was the Messiah when he was on this earth, which he's still on this earth, so I guess maybe we don't know. But I'm pretty certain that he's not, because Jesus is. Anyways, so we go to this movie, The Punisher, and this, all this bad stuff happens at the beginning, and this guy's whole family's wiped out, and he survives, and he goes off to this island, and, and this Haitian guy brings him back to life, and he's just like totally, he's a superhero. He's like one of the rare superheroes that doesn't really have superpowers, but that's, a, again, different discussion for a different time. And, and the guy uh, says, uh, may God be with you. And his response is, God's sitting this one out. And you're like, yes! <laughs> it's a movie, Right? I've since been transformed. I certainly would not respond that same way if I were to watch the movie today. But how often is it the case where we see, I mean, look, listen to these people. They're grumblers. They're malcontents. They're following their own sinful desires. They are loud mouth boasters. We can all list at least five people right now who we would be like, that's who that person is. And Jude says, they're not our concern. They're not our concern. It's not our job to execute judgment on these people. The Lord is going to show up. And he's not just going to show up. He's going to bring tens, ten thousands of his holy ones. And they're going to take care of it. So he sets up this, this really, like, these are the really bad people. I know they're there. Don't worry about them. He gives us in verse 17, but you, you meaning those who identify as followers of Jesus Christ, but you, you must remember. And this is the first imperative that we get in in this letter. This is what you are to do. You must remember, beloved, Again, this term of endearment. The predictions of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. They said to you, in the last time, there will be scoffers following their own ungodly passions. It is these who cause divisions, worldly people devoid of the Spirit. These people are going to come. These people are going to show up and they're going to infiltrate the, the church gatherings. This is going to happen. And you need to wipe them out. That's not what he says. He says, but you, beloved, again, reminding them, building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, Keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. He's saying all these people are going to show up and they're going to try to weasel their way into the, into the body, into the, the gathering of believers. They're coming and they're already here. Your job, right? Your one job that we just talked about on Sunday. 
building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keeping yourselves in the love of God. He says, Jude says, your one job is to not focus on these people, but to focus on your own faith and focus on building up your faith. Working at your faith. And it's so interesting, you know, as we've been you know, going through Philippians, and obviously we're in this Advent break, but we're still talking about our one job, and as we get back into Philippians, and Paul's going to say, work out your salvation. And we were kind of, it's like, it's a little bit like me and Tuna. We're just like, eek. You said work and faith. I thought it was free. Jude says, work on your faith, building up your most holy faith. How do we do that? He says, praying in the Holy Spirit. Praying in the Holy Spirit. Because we know that the Holy Spirit is the power of our prayer. We access God via the Holy Spirit and Jesus Christ. And so when we go to pray, this mystery of prayer, how does it even happen? It's via the Holy Spirit. We pray in the Holy Spirit. One thing, when we're praying in the Holy Spirit, we know that we are not praying in ourselves. We're not praying these selfish prayers. We're praying being guided by the Spirit. Keeping yourselves in the love of God. Again, this isn't this this passive, uh, just inactive concept of love. This is a an active, unadulterated, unconditional love. Because when we keep ourselves in the love of God, it flows out of us, which is a part of this working at our faith. Waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. Again, it's this, it's this concept where When we think about salvation, we think about, I am saved. And I'm going to experience eternal life in the end. It's this, I'm saved today, the now, and I'm working towards my eternal life in the end. It's not that I'm earning my eternal life, but through this, these exercises of of, Building our faith, praying in the Spirit, being in the love of God, we experience eternal life through the mercy of Jesus Christ. And it's interesting here because he uses mercy and actually in two different ways. Mercy, this type of mercy that he's talking about, is far closer to the Hebrew concept of chesed, or steadfast love, this commitment to unending bond of covenantal relationship. Whereas the mercy that he's talking about in verse 22 is the mercy that we typically think of. He says, and have mercy on those who doubt. So he sets up this picture of all these terrible people, they're coming, they've come, Focus on your faith. Focus on growing in your relationship with Christ. And how do we approach those people that we look at and that we see and we encounter who we have a temptation to judge and have a visceral negative response to? Have mercy on them. Have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. You're like, well, that escalated quite quickly. 
And again, there's some interesting conversation around what does he mean by the fire? There's really two options, one being the eternal fire of hell, which it would be interesting because he's talking in very temporal language around doubt that why would he be talking about something in the future, the, the fire of hell in the future when he's just talking in the present. Uh, Schreiner talks about more as this escalation of categories, this is literally a deathly situation. So when you see someone who's engaged in sinful behavior that will lead to their physical, actual death in the present, you have to rescue them. Because when you see someone in doubt, you can play the long game and you can say, extend them mercy, I see where you're at. You know, long game. If you see somebody who's in a burning building, it's not real effective to say, I noticed the structure is on fire. Um, last I checked, uh, there's a good chance that you're probably going to die. Might recommend maybe exiting the building if you feel like it. No, you're going to go save them. You're going to go get them out of the situation. And then the third category, because he loves threes. Do others show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by the flesh? And this gets a little bit more interesting. Because this mercy is mercy with fear. Because Jude knows the challenge that exists when we engage with people who are involved in sin. And he uses this language of the sin that exists in their lives is, has so permeated their life that it's actually seeping out onto their undergarment. Like if I took off this outer shirt, it would be seeping into my undershirt. There's this triad of different locations of people involved in sin. He's not categorizing, well, this sin is worse than that sin, which we've already been in that discussion. He's saying, you know, if you thought of it... Um, a little bit like the Olympic podium. It's like, in third bronze position is those who doubt. And in second position, those whose sin is staining their shirts. And at the top, we have those who are in the fire. Right? So it's not that one is, it, he's not saying this goes from bottom to top. He's giving us three different examples of people who are engaged in sinful behavior and how those who are followers of Christ should approach them. Notice there's no condemnation. There's no judgment. There's no, you should tell them what terrible human beings they are and that they're going to burn in hell. It's after you have worked on your faith, after we have worked on our faith, after I'm in the place where God wants me to be, my vision can then go to see people where they are at and respond accordingly. And I was thinking, we, I really wish that I would have cut this into two sections, but I didn't, so here we go. Because this is like the big finish. This is like the really big finish, the best finish of maybe any letter. This isn't like, oh yeah, and don't have any idols in your life. This is like way better than that. Now to him who was able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now and forevermore. Amen. I mean, this, this one sentence is like, ah, it's incredible. I mean, 
what Jude crams into one sentence, it, it is, ah! I mean, look at that. To him who is able to keep you from stumbling. You know, last time we were talking about this assurance of faith and, and being kept in the faith, and Jude says, we are talking about a Savior who keeps you from stumbling. You're going to stumble, and he's going to catch you, and he's going to be with you. And after he catches you from stumbling, he's going to take you. And much like a present, he's going to bring you, and he's going to present you with great joy to God. And you're just like, whoa! present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy to the only God. I mean, if we just thought about that for like a day, Jude is saying that Jesus is going to take us, protect us, and present us perfect, blameless, He's going to be so excited to be like, God, look at this present I have for you. Boom! What? I'm so excited. I just drooled all over the floor. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, he doesn't even say, through my brother, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever, infinity to infinity and beyond. Go Buzz Lightyear. God is in control. He has the dominion. He has the authority. He has the power. And I don't. How often, though, I want to just squeeze my way in there, especially when I see something that's happening. It's like when Nikki says, Eric, you just, you sit there at the counter, and I'm going to make dinner. And I say, okay. And then after about two minutes, I'm like, oh, what's going on? And she's over here, and then I start doing this. And she's like, what are you doing? I'm just helping. I mean, doing it right. She's like, get out of here. I'm doing this. I know, but if I did it, I would be helpful, which is code for, and do it the right way. (laughs) But how often is that? We see a situation where like, God, I know that you have dominion and authority, but let me show you how to do this. We're just like, are you kidding me? That is not the point. (laughs) Jude gives us, I mean, this little book that that for the most part we just disregard. We're like, oh yeah, that's the book like before the really good stuff. It's like there's that short, super short two books. Then there's that like shorter book. And then like the real stuff, Revelation, right? And then we read it and our minds are like, Jude's whole concept is there are bad people that are going to try and infiltrate and have infiltrated. Don't get so worked up and so focused on them. Focus on your faith and remember that I, the Lord, am in control and I've got this. And all God's people are like, Amen. I can still say, Go to your groups in the plural. (laughs) 